Amen. Well, I want to thank those who came in yesterday to transform our sanctuary, bring in all of the red, the plants, the 50 candles on the communion table, the clocks. It, it brings us into a Pentecost environment, and that's where we find ourselves today. So our second scripture reading continues the story of the birth of the church that we started our service with this morning. We'll be beginning in Acts 2, verses 14 to 15, and then continuing on. Hear the word of the Lord. Then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice, and addressed the crowd that had drawn near. Fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain these things to you and listen carefully to what I say. These people are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only nine o'clock in the morning. Fellow Israelites, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs which God did among you through him, as you yourselves know. This man was handed over to you by God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge, and you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death, because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. When the people heard these things, they were cut to the heart, and they said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? And Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children, and for all who are far, far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. With many other words, he warned them and pleaded them, Save yourselves from this corrupt generation. And those who accepted his message were baptized. And about 3,000 were added to their number that day. This is the word of the Lord for us. Thanks be to God. Well, Pentecost, as we mentioned already, is known as the birthday of the church. And so I want to start this morning by asking, how do you celebrate birthdays in your household? Jim, how do you celebrate birthdays in your household? Well, Marshall and I and Sue's dad, we open Christmas presents. You open Christmas presents on your birthday. That's right, because your birthday is. December 25. How about you, Michelle? How do you guys know? Well, I've been getting to do the windy thing, so uh, fireworks go off. Fireworks for a first person. Outstanding. Outstanding. Robin, how do you guys celebrate? Well, depending on my family, Okay. A special dinner. That's a nice way of doing it. You know, a lot of times, well, let's find out. How, how do you uh, celebrate birthdays? Friends and family. Friends and family gathering together, having a good time. Anything else? Cake and ice cream. Cake and ice cream. There you go. Anything else? You took your answer already. You know, sometimes gifts are exchanged uh, during uh, birthdays. You know, a friend of mine uh, asked his wife, you know, what, what do you want me to get you for your birthday? She said, I don't know. Something with diamonds, lots of diamonds. <laughs> so he gave her a little box that was wrapped up. She opened it up and it was a deck of cards. <laughs> There's 13 of them. What do you want? <laughs> In our house, one of the ways that we celebrate birthdays is by looking back and celebrating the now. Two things. We look back, remembering when our little ones were born. Going over the narrative of that special time. And then exclaiming at how they've grown and what they've done and how, what, what new things that they are able to accomplish. And that's what I want us to do this morning as we come to the birthday of the church. Let's look back on the extraordinary narrative 
of the things that happened that first Pentecost. And then let's look forward as we reflect together on the state of the church here at Southminster, June 4, 2017. So Acts 2 begins, when the day of Pentecost came, the disciples were all together in one place. And suddenly there's this sound like the blowing of a violent wind. And tongues of fire rest upon each of them that are there. And they start to speak in all of these strange languages. Wind, fire, tongues. Three supernatural phenomena that are linked to the manifestation of the third person in the Trinity. Holy Spirit. Now, in our Reformed tradition, we don't spend a lot of time on the Holy Spirit. Presbyterians have throughout history been a lot more about God the Father and Christ the Son, leaving the work of the Spirit to those other Christian groups, maybe the Charismatics or the Pentecostals. And if you look at what the Spirit does, when it makes its grand entrance in Acts 2, that kind of makes sense. The Spirit roars in uncontrollably. It's wild. It stirs everything up. We Presbyterians, we like things. See if there's any old Presbyterians in here. <laughs> Decently and in Okay, the, the, the old Presbyterians are still asleep. Decently and in order. That's right. That's the way we operate. The first Pentecost was anything but. So it's a little uncomfortable for us, perhaps, to focus on the Holy Spirit. But I want to challenge that this morning because now more than ever, we are in a time where we need the Holy Spirit. We need the Holy Spirit in order to grow into what we want to become here at Southminster and as people of faith in this radically changing world. We need the Holy Spirit. You might not know the name Angelo Dundee, but I'll bet you've heard of Muhammad Ali, probably one of the most famous boxers of all time. Now, for two decades, Angelo Dundee was in Muhammad Ali's corner. Literally, he was Muhammad Ali's corner man. And it's his job to make Ali float like the butterfly and sting like the bee. He described his job in this way. He said, when you're working with a fighter, you're a surgeon, you're an engineer, and a psychologist. You're going to do whatever it takes to help your guy win. That's the Holy Spirit. That's what the Holy Spirit does. I want you to think of the Holy Spirit as your corner spirit. There behind you, ready to empower you, equip you, repair you, strengthen you, patch you up when you've been knocked around, and send you back out into the ring of life again. I'm glad that he's in our form. The Holy Spirit fills us with power, with purity, and with a passion for the gospel. Power, purity, and passion for the gospel. That's what was going on in that upper room on that first Pentecost. The Spirit blows into the room like a mighty wind. And, you know, the words breath and wind and spirit all have the same root in the ancient world. It's ruach in the Hebrew. It's pneuma in the Greek. So it's fitting that the one that we call haagias pneuma, the Holy Spirit, should begin his work by blowing in to that upper room like a rushing wind. There are a few forces in our world that are as powerful as wind. And if you've experienced the terrifying power of a tornado or a hurricane, you know firsthand 
the awesome, terrifying power of wind. So it's a fitting representation of the awesome power of God that the Holy Spirit is revealed in such a way. After the wind comes tongues of fire resting on those that are gathered here. Fire in the Spirit, in the Scriptures, is almost always associated with purity. It's like that live coal that was brought from the altar and placed on the lips of Isaiah the prophet, cleansing him and preparing him to go out and speak the word to Israel. The tongues of fire become a visible manifestation of the purity of God's people as they're gathered in Jesus' name. And that's why we have red candles on the communion table, the red cloth on the cross, reminding ourselves of the fire of the purity that comes at Pentecost. And finally, the disciples begin to speak in different languages. They speak boldly. So that all who are about their business, bustling through the busy streets of Jerusalem that day, could hear them. They hear these followers of Christ speaking about Christ, but not in the official languages, not in Greek or Aramaic or Hebrew. They heard in every tongue and dialect so that all in Jerusalem could hear the gospel message in their own native language. Parthians, Medes, Elamites, Mesopotamians, Judeans, Cappadocians, Pontians, Asians, Phrygians, Pamphylians, Egyptians, Libyans, Romans, Grecians, Arabs, and so many more, all heard <coughs> the word of God proclaimed to them in their own language from the lips of these men and women in the upper room. The ancient curse of Babel. We go all the way back to early in Genesis to remember when God confused languages, scattering people far and wide so they could not come together and form a power base to challenge God. God dispersed them across the world. Now God is bringing them back together in unity to hear the message of the gospel in all of their different languages, proclaiming for the first time in history that the revelation of God is no longer limited to a select group of people with a special language. No, God's revelation is meant now for all. And we get that at Pentecost. So in these three ways, the church is born. It's born in power with wind. It's born in purity with fire, and it's born as the curse of battle is lifted, and the good news can now be shared to all. This is the birthday of the church. It's the birthday that we can celebrate as ours, as the people of God, remembering what God has done. And what's interesting to me about these elements, these wind and fire, is that they're both ages that humans have been able to use as a blessing in their own lives. Think of the Holy Spirit as the agency through which we operate. Just as the power of wind has been used to propel ships, to grind grain, to move water, pump water, so the power of the Spirit can move us towards the purposes of our Heavenly Father and fire, which can comfort and warm when it is dark and cold. The way the Spirit comes along as we sang about the comfort. The fire can also burn hot and strong to shape and to forge tools, transforming metal lumps into something useful. So the Spirit, too, can forge us into instruments of God's glory by burning hot within our souls. So on this birthday of the church, it's good to take a step back for a moment and remember where we've come from, to think about the one who has brought us to this point. And it's important to look at what the Spirit is doing now, here at Southminster. 
today is a little bit special for me. We've had a 50th anniversary, we mentioned it the prayers. I've got a one year anniversary of being here with all of you. It's a little hard to believe. It's been quite a year and we've made a lot of strides together. You have moved from the tenure of your beloved Pastor Steve for 35 years into a new chapter in your history. We've seen staff transitions, wonderful to have Sue. We've seen outreach to our larger community with BBS and Gen 3, which is tremendous. We went through Mission Possible and answered the stewardship call. We celebrated Advent and Christmas, Lent and Easter with tremendous worship both with contemporary and traditional through the leadership of Keith and Lee and our wonderful choir. You know, I could go on all day about the things that we have done together over the last 12 months, but I kind of think that you might have plans this afternoon. The point I want you to hear this morning is that on this Pentecost Sunday, the birthday of the church and an anniversary of my relationship with all of you, we're doing really well here at Southwest. And you should be proud of that. It doesn't always go this way. And it will be a transition. It will continue to be a transition as we journey through this interim time in the year that's ahead. It's a transition that has seen change and stability. New faces, and old, but the mission and ministry of the church continues with a wonderful spirit of vibrancy and vitality. That's something we're going to hear more about after our worship time in our report from the CAT team. You know, last February, 175 of you took time to respond to our congregational assessment tool, CAT, to give us a sense of how we're doing as a church. Now, I'm not going to step too much on the toes of the cat team that will give a more detailed report, but I want you to understand how significant this is for our congregation. What you told us through this instrument is that you are excited about the vitality and the vibrancy of Southminster and its mission. There are things that are going well. You are excited, you are energized, you are satisfied, and yet, in the midst of that, there are growth areas for us to attend to as well. And I want to touch on a couple. In the CAP survey, you said that we want to see more young families and children in our congregation. And that's got to be a high priority for us as we move forward in where we want to be as a church. Part of that initiative will be driven by staffing. And at the end of this summer, we'll be saying farewell to Kirsten Almos, our children's and youth director. And what I want each one of you to commit to doing this summer, I want you to put it right at the top of your prayer list, because I want you to be praying for the person that God is calling to come and serve with us in the areas of children's and youth ministry in this coming year. Put that at the top of your prayer, prayer list. And let's keep praying for that person, that man or that woman that God has already identified, that we might be able to find that person and bring that person to you. A second priority that we heard from you is that you want to be strengthened and equipped for ministry in the church. And when I heard that, I got a real big smile. And that smile hasn't stopped. You want to be equipped for ministry in the church. And I can't wait to find the right ways to engage with each one of you into meaningful ministry that fits with your personalities and your spiritual gifts. So as a result, this fall, our focus is going to be on spiritual gifts, exploring what those gifts are through Scripture and how they are given to each one of us. And as we grow to understand better how God has 
gifted each one of us for ministry, we'll be able to empower and encourage one another to succeed in the ministries that are right for each one of us. I'm excited about that. Just a couple of previews for the year that's ahead. The third one is vitality, spiritual vitality. And that's going to be another challenge for us, because you'll hear from the CAT team that that, that one is a little bit lower uh, of a score for us in relation to other churches. So we're going to work together to figure out how can we deepen our spiritual faith, our faith and connection to God over the coming months as well, in worship and in study and in fellowship, all of those different ways. The thing that is that I want you to hear more than anything is that God has got Southeastern right where He wants you right now. We've had a great first year together, and I'm excited to see what God has in store for us. So as we celebrate the birth of the church, the movement of the Holy Spirit, as we see how God has demonstrated His power. In the past, we need to be open for how God will demonstrate that power and that purity and that passion for communicating the gospel through us, just as he did that first Pentecost long ago. Let us fix our eyes on what is ahead in these coming months, for I know that God has much in store. But now, join me as we come to our birthday feast, as we celebrate together at the table of the Lord.